Esther Betzler is a San Antonio treasure. There is hardly a social service organization or humanitarian effort that has not been the recipient of Esther's talent, time, and treasure. The National Council of Jewish Women has reason to be grateful for Esther's support. She has been a member for over 70 years. She was a two-time section president and held just about every position on the local level. Esther was district chair and served on the National Board of Directors. She is the recipient of the Hannah G. Solomon Award. Named for the organization's founder, it is NCJW's highest recognition. Recently, Marsha Walgeyer and I, Lee Markman, had a conversation with Esther about her NCJW involvement. That conversation was filmed and edited by Rhonda Grimm, and here it is. Well, Esther, I wanted to ask you about how you first got involved with the National Council of, of Jewish Women. Well, I guess I could say I put my foot down because when I was a little girl and I had older brothers arguing with me and I would be not going back to my mother would say, you got to put your foot down. And so I learned very young to put my foot down and to skip a lot of years when my husband and I married and we got back from our honeymoon the first people who called on me were Francis Callison and Selma Adelman they were the leaders in the yes. Council of Jewish Women both had been presidents and they didn't invite me they told me <laughs> that I was going to be a member of council and uh, they were very good examples and we always are standing on the shoulders of the forebears so we owe a lot to whoever came before us and uh, that's how I joined council. Okay so I was going to ask you and I think you partially already answered it what do you think there is in your own background and upbringing that led you to be a social activist? Well, I can say that very simply because faith and humanity were our two words in council. My faith, my Judaism, all of the things that I, I've done in my life re relate to that background and partly, of course, to my family who brought it to us. Um, the other big influence of humanity uh, I got just from living in a community and seeing some of the things that are not right that could be corrected. And even though I didn't have any power at all, uh, those things impressed me. And it goes back to before we were integrated when I had to see our help go upstairs in the back elevator to go to the Majestic Theater to sit in the balcony because they could come in the front way. And we, my, my brothers and I, and my sisters, would sit with our help instead of going down and seeing them go up. So, you know, we saw some injustices. We didn't have enough uh, guts, I guess, to do anything about it as young people. And I'm so proud that today young people get activated when they're in, before their teens. They know things are going wrong and um, they try to do something about it. In those days, I think we did what we were told. We didn't have the right to overcome some grown-ups programs. They already knew what they were doing. So I think that's it. Of all the NCJW projects that you were involved in, what are some of the ones that stand out most to you? Well, that's easy because uh, when I became involved, I really became involved. Uh, one of the earliest ones was literacy, and that went way beyond, beyond uh, uh, our years because from very early, there was always a, some kind of a feeling that we should get uh, new Americans, we called them then, integrated into the community. And the only way you can do that really is through language. So 
so my mother's generation and my older sisters, my husband's family, all of them had been involved in some kind of reading program to help these people. But when council saw a real need, what they did is they went behind it and pushed it, and we uh, were able to get funding and getting a place uh, to teach people to read. We hired a, a national group which was called One, Each One Teach One, mm -hmm. and we had trainers down here to teach us how to do that. And we, we educated a lot of people. We hired a woman named Margarita Huantes, who sort of took over and it became Margarita Huantes Literacy mm -hmm. Project. And from there it went to San Antonio Literacy Council. And since then we've had food programs, still have, starting with this new one with kindergarten, which I think is wonderful. Are there some others that are very close to your heart? Other projects that are very close to your heart? Well, the, the, uh, very close to my heart is the, the one with blind children. Uh, a friend of mine at, from UCLA who lived in, in Temple, Texas, had a child at the same time our son was born. And her, her daughter, Sarah Lee, had something called retrolental fibroplasia and it was caused because they didn't know then when premature babies needed right. oxygen, how much to get they needed, them. and it was off, and it caused this blind condition. And so we kept in touch, and I saw what she did in Dallas. I owe it all to her because she told us every inch of the way, and we carried it into San Antonio, and finally got eight children who were educable and we found a, a, a principal who was interested. It was Agnes Cotton School on Blanco Road, and uh, the principal uh, allowed us to come in and teach, and we hired people to teach us how to teach, and eventually the city gave us the use of a land of library. It had a little house on, on that property, and it became the happy hour school. So I was very involved with that. We, we volunteered all the time. I'm thinking of something I hadn't thought of before, but when I, when you obligate yourself to something like that, it's really meaningful if you show up. It's no good if you're there now and then. So if you have every day, and I had babies at that time, and I had to hire somebody to stay with my babies so that I could go teach these kids. And I think many others did that too because we felt it was so important. And eventually it became uh, available to those kids. I used to bump into a couple of them now and then, I haven't lately because I don't go out much, but they all remember with gratitude that that was their beginnings. Their parents know that. And uh, it was just wonderful to see yeah. And I know there was a teenage pregnancy prevention program that you were very involved yeah. with. Well, there's a nun here for many years. Many people will remember her, Sister Mary Boniface O'Neill, mm -hmm. and Sister <laughs> Sister Boniface, as we called her. I remember sitting on this couch with my brother's arm mm -hmm. around her, and she he was telling her dirty jokes. <laughs> <laughs> so she was, she was a different kind of sister, but with great heart. And when she got her arms around you, you couldn't get out. So for 10 years, I worked with her. Although I had a job, by the way, of my own at that time, uh, which is another story, we at Healy Murphy, with council help and many people contributing to getting this set up, had a program to try to, to curb teenage pregnancies and it's pretty discomforting right now when I know when I talk to people and bump into them and I'm maybe in touch with Healy Murphy from time to time that it's still very bad mm -hmm. and we thought we were doing such a great thing but it was a start at least for people to understand that that was going to be a big problem 
And I bumped in people today that were in that program, and it's wow. very heart-filling. What kinds of things did you do with these young women? Well, uh, my yoga friend and I felt they could learn more about their body, about health, about childhood, babies, and what it was not so much fun about, and try to get them the real see what you see. When we ask them, how does your mother feel about this, you're pregnant, oh, she's so thrilled. Mm -hmm. Well, later we would talk to the mothers, and the mothers say, I brought up those kids, I don't want any babies. <laughs> but it's a problem you have to deal with in your own way, and those families, I feel bad for them, but we stopped many things happening. Sister Boniface was a wonderful social worker, and she would go into the home and see what's happening, and, and there were just dreadful stories that I wouldn't want to tell you that we discovered with problems with these kids at home, uh, such as we still have, unfortunately. And we figured something had to be done about it. So, uh, but we had one friend of mine who was a, a a doctor, and she would come and tell them, teach them without about their bodies. And I and my friend yoga, and most of all, we try to get nutrition. We used to bring cheese and fruits, and we told the girls, if you quit bringing in Cokes and Fritos, we'll bring breakfast, because it was first mm -hmm. period. And we did that for a long time, for 10 years, in fact. Meanwhile, my friend left and I stayed, because when Sister Boniface got her hands on you, no way you could get away. <laughs> <laughs> also, the Wicks program? The Wicks program was trying to get people to, especially Latinos, to let their daughters join the Women's Job Corps. Right, right. They had men's job corps and people were floating into them, but we didn't have many women's job corps. So they actually hired some of us after being trained to go to these communities in pairs. We had to go with a minority and an Anglo. We did this in conjunction with the YWCA and with their help, we went to various communities and we recruited people, talking to the parents, trying to get them to understand that this was going to be a way to get educated. And in those days, that was very difficult. You didn't live in an area. A lot of the things, as you all know, depend on location. And we had a lot of redlining kind of mm. things then, where people had to be in a certain area. One of the wonderful uh, feeling things I had happen to me was Kenwood, which is just a few blocks from here. And many people said it grew up because the wealthy people in almost part needed help. It was not developed. They didn't have running water. They didn't have really. Anything. Anyway, we had our help from there, like many people in this area. And it was just tragic. And my sister was one of the first people we got Council was involved along the way, of course, to help get paving, to get electricity, and to be able to do something with their, their students. In integration, there was a black school and a Latin American school. Sojourner Truth was Latin, was the, the black school, and I became very close to Joyce Souls, who's still living, who was the principal at that time, and she was a help. Many people were helpful. People from Trinity Health. But we finally got them to see that <clears throat> they called it the Princeton Plan in those days, where you could have grades one, two, and three at one school, and then the others at another school, and they'd be mixed. And uh, I remember going to the superintendent and having him say to me, well, you'll have to prove to us that it would be an improvement. So I said, how can we prove to you when we can't try it? <laughs> we have to try it. Anyway, with, with a lot of help, we got them to try that, and it, it's been effective ever since. Well, it seems to yeah. me one of the principles 
that you, you realized was that you could not do everything by yourself or council couldn't do everything by itself. It needed to partner with people in the community and you did that so well. The, the method that we used, you looked and you looked like you were taking a survey of what's needed and you try to fill that gap whatever way you can and then you tried to get it to last and you couldn't keep it forever so you were interested other people and other groups and then when it's taken over and you knew it was in capable hands you could start another. Beside your work in the local community I understand you were involved with the regional board and also you were on the national board of the National Council of Jewish Women. Um, what highlights of that experience stand out for you? <clears throat> well, I love to travel, so I love going to these places. It was usually in one day, uh, so I wasn't away from the family very long. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> it was very telling. We started some, se some sections, we didn't call them chapters, and we started sections in quite a few smaller towns. Uh, I, I assume many of them are still in existence, but it was wonderful being able to uh, get people interested and in, involved in something that was so close to our hearts. And I remember one particular trip to Kansas City where we had some cousins by marriage, and they said to me, you know what, I'm glad you're here, but..." Why did they send you here? Don't we have people in Kansas City that know as much as you do? And I said, I hate to say it, but I don't think so, because we had training for this, and we had to do a lot of study. It wasn't something that you just pick up and do, and I uh, couldn't get over that. But uh, we it was not easy sometimes. You almost had to sort of fight your way in the same way we had to do when we tried to get low-income housing things. We had to go to the banks and I remember facing all these bankers and one of our bankers, Mr. Cheever, said, oh, I, we know about you, but what do you know about banking? What about housing? I said, well, I'll, I've been studying it for two years, so I don't know what I know, but I think I know a little bit about it. You had to really um, approach yourself, what my granddaughter now would call aggressive. Uh -huh. You have to be aggressive. My granddaughter taught me that. No, good, you know? good. And she is aggressive. <laughs> good um, I understand that you were one of 200 women in the whole country invited to the White House to form a Women's Committee on Human Rights. Can you tell us about that experience? It was a very exciting weekend. Uh, one thing was a little embarrassing. Uh, when we had a session in the Rose Garden before it started the night before, um, we had people introducing us. And Liz Carpenter was uh, secretary then, and she handed me a card and she said, in the morning, uh, Lady Bird would like you to have coffee with them in the morning. And I um, I said, oh, I can't. I just made a reservation to go with the group to Williamsburg. <laughs> and she was very bright. She handed me her card, and she said, when you change your mind, give me a card. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, I went right to the hotel room and called her and said, yeah. And we took, uh, my husband had an aunt living there, right outside of Washington, and she told me to bring anybody I liked from Texas. And so I invited Aunt Lil, and uh, she was very proper with gloves and hat and all that. <clears throat> and she looked up what you knew what the protocol was, and you're supposed to sit for 20 minutes, not longer, and then you say thank you for seeing you know, walk out. We tried that, and Lady Bird said, you haven't seen the stuff we brought from India, and I want to show you the mm -hmm. girls' garden and all these things you can't leave. So she said, well, I'm going to 
serves something to you that you probably don't know about. It's called a brown cow. <laughs> we use it in Texas a lot. And it's ice cream and root beer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Johnson was supposed to come in and join us. And he was having a portrait made, the one by Mr. Hurd, remember, that yes. had so much bad PR because I've seen it he too. didn't like it. Anyway, he was sitting for that portrait that morning, and he, we did, didn't get to see him then, but he spoke to us at the meetings, and he was just fantastic. And people now, I think, are recognizing that we wouldn't have the civil rights that we have now if it hadn't been for Lyndon Johnson. He's getting a lot more credit. Um, today, many women have uh, careers and uh, full-time jobs uh, as they raise their families. What would you like young women to know about volunteerism and social action? Oh my goodness. <clears throat> I don't think I have to say anything now because it seems to be in the air. There are so many groups that have grown out of activism especially women's groups. I get something every day from Women International, Women National, a different uh, name for everything. Uh, and it isn't just women, of course. Men have, have uh, done their part. But uh, trying to get social action is, is a, a well understood principle now. And I don't think it was so much in the United States. I think people were more self-satisfied and they wanted to work themselves up first and then somebody else comes later. And I think it was, we have a different and I think better attitude. Our perspectives have changed a lot, as you know, as, as life has changed for many of us. It's a different world we live in now. In fact, I'm still in Harold, and I say we're we're still in the past century. <laughs> we don't we, we don't understand the language sometimes if they use what is Wi-Fi. I don't. What was Wi-Fi? Well, now I know all about what Wi-Fi is. <laughs> but you know, we 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 were a different culture, a different society, a different thing. But fortunately, most of the the young people particularly have grown and picked up on all the technical uh, things that we've developed and um, I hope it'll be a better world. I worry a little bit about the current generation of kids in elementary school where they're not learning cursive writing because how will they be able to read my <laughs> Esther. A couple of years ago, you were honored by the Battered Women. Yeah. And you got up and read a chapter from the book that you had written on your mom, because mm. it was Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. And I was there, and after it, I said to you that you did a wonderful job, that you had gotten up, and this was, you were in your 90s, it was a couple of years ago. Yeah. And you got up and read the chapter and did everything, and you had to edit the chapter to make it smaller f for the group. And when I told you what a wonderful job you did, you said to me, you always have to give yourself a challenge. And that is what life is about. And I think you have given yourself a challenge Don't throughout your whole cry. I'm not going to make you cry. <laughs> but I think you have given yourself a challenge throughout your whole life and the entire community is the benefit of it. Well, now I think it's our well, we turn have in, to meet in, the challenge. You know, in, in our ritual in Judaism, we have the expression tikkun olam, mm -hmm. and it means to, to repair the world. And what it begins to, to do, you can do the little corner where you live, and if you do that little piece, and another person does that little piece, then you accomplish what we hope we will leave the world at least or most hopefully better than because we were here. That's, I guess, my chief goal <laughs> is Perfect. to try to do tikkun alone. 
I have one other thing that came from Judaism that I'm a, my, I'd like to share, and that is the word mitzvah. Uh, my motto to myself, um, I'm what we call, you know, we have a name for it in yoga, but what you say to yourself is what you want to do is a mitzvah a day. So every day it's so easy to find something you need to do, but if the day ends and you haven't done anything mitzvah that day, what you do is you pick up the telephone and you call somebody maybe you haven't seen in a long time, or maybe you heard they were sick, or maybe, you know, you'd have a reason. They, I just want to know how you are. And it means a great deal, especially to older people who sometimes don't hear the phone ring. And it, just to getting a call, I have one friend, she can be down in the dumps, and she gets one phone call, and she'll call back, and she'll say, everything's okay now, you know? I, I didn't say thank you for being here, but I want to quote Milton Bendiner, who was one of the brightest men I ever knew. And when he got up and was honored, as I'm being honored today, he had a wonderful expression. He said, I'm bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> so I thank you, I'm bankrupt. Thank you.